So Alex, uh, you're the creator and primary proponent of an economic analysis you call consumer monetary theory. Uh, you're writing a book about it at present. And while it has similarities to modern monetary theory, which is gaining a lot of political currency at the moment, uh, your view also has some very important differences from MMT. So first off, what is MMT and why are people talking about it? <laughs> That's a tough question. Uh, I think the biggest thing that people identify with MMT is the idea that taxes don't fund government spending. Uh, and then it's also associated with things like a federal jobs guarantee and stuff like that. It's a way of thinking about uh, how money works uh, and how government spending works. What are the constraints on uh, money in the economy? Uh, let, let's go over what you, you basically you agree with MMT and then what you basically disagree with. I've got a nice list from you here. So uh, the four most important things would be taxes don't pay for government spending. Government spending is constrained by productive capacity slash real resources. The government cannot default on debt issued in its own currency and trade deficits are generally good. Um, but you disagree with MMT when they say that the goal should be full employment, uh, that taxes give the currency its value, that higher interest rates are inflationary, and taxation curbs inflation. So you disagree with all four of those. Let's, um, let's take them one at a time. So firstly, um, we'll build some common ground first. So yeah, uh, they like to stress that taxes don't pay for government spending. And this is, I think, perhaps the most important point and the one that uh, most ordinary people are quite surprised when you start talking to them as if taxes don't pay for government spending. So why do you agree with MMT that this is in fact the case? Uh, well, you have to think about uh, what makes government spending possible. So the way I think about the economy is that what it does is it's an engine for producing goods and services for consumers. So you've got a flow of goods and, uh, goods and services coming from the productive economy going to consumers, and then you've got a flow of money going in the opposite direction. So a question we can ask is what makes it possible for consumers to spend money? Well, there has to be goods and services for them to claim with that money. Uh, so what constrains government spending is the same thing. There has to be something for them to buy with the money. So what makes government spending possible is that the economy can produce something for the government to buy, uh, just as if they were a consumer. Uh, so, so to say that taxes fund taxes make government sp spending possible doesn't really make sense unless those taxes are somehow uh, creating more capacity uh, for the government to buy things from the economy. Um, well, let's explore that a little bit. So one thing I like to think about in terms of explaining this, tell me if you think this is right, that if we're talking about like commodity money, I mean like real physical resources and that's what's being used as money. Well, in theory, then a government does need to tax. It needs to somehow physically collect this this stuff and redistribute it out to people but this is different in a fiat currency system right if we're if we're talking about money that's either printed or created you know by keystrokes in bank terminals it, it doesn't work that way right the state doesn't actually have to go around collecting stuff it just creates the money yeah um so it's yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question because you can think about like a, a local city government or something like that. In order mm. to spend money, uh, they generally have to get money from somewhere in order to be able to spend it. So that's analogous to having like gold or something. It's not something that they control. But then, then again, to some extent, they can uh, borrow against their credit, borrow against the productive capacity of their city, that kind of stuff. So they can potentially spend money without spending money, as it were, because they're spending promises uh, to pay some other form of money. Uh, now, if you look at the level of the United States government, they don't have any higher promise beyond the productive capacity of their economy and the credit they can get from uh, other people who want to lend to them. Uh, so, so that's kind of the, uh, in, in, term, in, in terms of, there's no constraint on the absolute nominal amount of money they can spend. The constraint is that they want to maintain the stable purchasing power of the money so that it, it continues to be money, something that people can reliably use as money. And the constraint on that is that as they spend and as consumers spend, they actually have to be buying uh, a commensurate amount of goods and services. If you mess up that balance, then you, then you get inflation or deflation or something like that. I like that way of putting it. There's no higher promise. So, so the constraint on the spending now, now, 
just because um, they're not constrained by tax doesn't mean they're not constrained at all. So the constraint here isn't that there's some magic number of the, the deficit getting too high or the national get, debt getting too high, but is what in your view? Uh, so, right, there's a constraint on the amount of spending, not on, on the amount of debt. The, the constraint, and it's not necessarily the amount of spending, but where that spending is going. So if you're handing money to consumers uh, and they're spending it to buy goods and services, then the question is, what is the economy's capacity to produce goods and services uh, for those consumers? So that's the constraint. The constraint is real, real resources. Right. And, and, and right. you yeah. and NMMT are both pretty consistent on this. It's real resources, productive capacity of real resources. That's really what right. is the, the, the limiting the size. That's the size of your real economy. Yeah. And, and I would add that access to real resources can partly be determined uh, by how much credit you have uh, in the global economy. So, for example, if China mm. trusts that the dollar is going to be stable and they want to keep sending us cheap steel, that that's more resource, real resources that are available to us because China trusts the dollar. Right. So there's, there's an element of trust there. It's not just going around and looking at how much stuff there is. It's also going around and looking at how much stuff are, is, are people willing to sell us. Gotcha. Um, MMT people will frequently stress, especially when we're talking about in the sphere of international trade relations, that the, you know, the government cannot default on debt issued in its own currency. Do you agree with that? I both agree and disagree. Mm. So nominally, they can't default. They're always going, if they have a, a debt denominated in dollars, they're always going to be able to pay the dollars. Um, but if they end up uh, spending more into the economy than the economy can handle due to the you know, resource constraints, that kind of stuff, uh, then what you're going to see is inflation. And inflation is like a partial default on all of the dollars in the economy. So you still face uh, some of the same risks uh, in terms of credit risks, that kind of stuff. Um, it just looks a little bit different when you're when the default is spread out across the economy. I mean, are you are you trying to say that um, it's not so much that the government that that the government running into hyperinflation, devaluing its currency? That's basically the government's way of going bankrupt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, yeah. So now we're, well, elaborate on that a little bit, like, um, because I've heard, I hear MT people stress this a lot. It's like the government can't go bankrupt. And I know what they mean when they say that, right? Um, why do you choose to say, just phrase it this way? Why, why, why would you, why do you want to emphasize that it is, it is ultimately kind of a question of debt? Um, well, I think, I think part of the reason I frame it this way is that sometimes when people um, hear the MMT people talk, they think they're saying things that are that are really impossible when really they're just saying this thing that's technically true. Technically the government can't default on its debt because it can always print money, whatever. But you know, like you can print as much money as you want. It's not going to enable you to buy more stuff and you still face the same credit risks. Um, if you, if you run out of resources, you know, that kind of thing, you can't make the economy do more than it's physically capable of. And the MMT people will acknowledge this, but I think the fact that they emphasize that the government can't default as if it's like this really important thing, the government, even a sovereign, a monetarily sovereign government faces many of the same, uh, constraints on spending that a non-monetarily sovereign, uh, government does. There's more flexibility, mm. but it's not, you know, it's, they can't just do whatever they want. And MMT people agree with this. Yes, and I'm sure they do, but I think they might also try to say that that what they're what they're trying to do is they're trying to push back against what they call the household budget analogy. They're trying to mm -hmm. really uh, call into question this idea that um, that j just the way you balance your budget uh, as a household or private business that that's how we should think of state spending and taxes. So are they are they wrong to say this? Uh, I don't think they're wrong. I think it's a continuum between. Um, who has to balance their budget in terms of dollars and who has to budget their economy in terms of resources and where credit fits into all of that. Um, you know, how much can a person or a household borrow compared to how much can a government borrow? Um, I would say that, you know, the government could borrow an infinite amount of money and it's not a problem as long as they're not uh, spending too much money into the economy. So there's a constraint on spending, but there's no constraint on on borrowing per se for the government, especially if they're just issuing debt and, and another arm of the government is buying up that debt, then there's no limit. Um, but a household could do that too. I could, I could say, um, I owe you, you know, 10 quadrillion dollars and I could come in and say, Oh, thanks Alex. Uh, we've got, you know, 10 quadrillion dollars of debt here. 
not, you know, like, it, it, you know, the, there's, there's not as much of a difference between households and governments as maybe the um, MMT people would like to, would like mm. to emphasize, but they are calling attention. They're, they're trying to draw attention to this very uh, important point that for any uh, economic actor, it's not um, strictly about balancing the budget all the time. It's about what are your constraints and the constraints are um, slightly different for, for a government that actually uh, manages and issues the, uh, the currency. Right. Right. Uh, it's so you're more stressing the, the kind of graduated difference between a, being a currency user versus being a currency issuer. And the government just kind of happens to be very heavily on the side of currency yeah. issuer. And generally speaking, when I communicate this stuff, I like to emphasize what is true and how stuff does work rather than what's not true and how stuff doesn't work. Uh, why do you do that? What's what are the pitfalls of emphasizing what doesn't work? Well, if I, if I come in saying, no, 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 you're wrong, it's not like that, I'm, I'm uh, you know, starting from an, an antagonistic position, right? Um, whereas if I'm talking about like, hey, you know, um, the government can spend more money here because there's stuff for them to buy, uh, then that's kind of a more friendly way of, of, of talking about these things. Gotcha. And speak of the devil, now we've slid from kind of where you agree into where you disagree, so we can get more antagonistic. Now, let's start with more of the, the technical um, things that you you take issue with. So um, MMT will talk a lot about taxes giving the currency its value, that the taxes, that's that's a foundational thing that the state does that creates uh, value for the currency. Uh, what's your issue with this? Um, so I think that story can be a story about how you give something value. Uh, so for example, uh, government could declare um, as a tax, every citizen owes me uh, an iron ball. I don't know why I'm on iron balls today, but uh, every citizen owes me an iron ball at the end of the year. Um, and that means that everybody now at the end of the year is going to go out and buy an iron ball so they can give it to the government to pay their taxes. It doesn't turn the iron ball into currency. So just because you're taxing in a particular unit doesn't uh, make it currency. Currency is something more fundamental to the market, which is that it's the standard unit of value in which markets set prices. So anytime you have a market economy, you need a currency, you need standard money uh, in order for supply to meet demand, that kind of thing. Um, so certainly most of the time, you know, governments do tax in the currency and certainly um, taxes can be one of the things that you can claim using your currency, um, but it's not the only thing. And the, the most important thing about currency is that it can be traded uh, as a standard unit for anything you might want to claim in the economy. Yeah, I like how you put it the other day when you're talking about, uh, you know, Warren Moser's speech about, you know, business cards and there's a guy in the, in the, with a gun at the door and he says everyone, okay, you know, we're going to take these business cards or else we're going to shoot you. So it, it makes the business cards valuable, but, it, but it, it's actually people trading with the cards for other goods and services. That's what's going to keep it valuable. Otherwise, yeah. you're just going to do whatever you need to do to get the business cards to not get shot. Right. So money needs, currency needs to be stable in terms of the value of consumer goods. Uh, so because Warren Mosler says you need to get one of these business cards in order to be able to get out of here alive, uh, that does not make it money. It makes it valuable. It makes it something that people want to buy, but it doesn't make it money. Money is the common standard unit. Um, okay, here's another technical point. Higher interest rates are inflationary. This is something that, according to you, MMT people say, uh, but you believe the opposite is true. Why is that? Yeah, uh, so I think it's, it's useful to think about um, where money comes from in the economy. Uh, and it's, it's certainly true. So the MMT people are right that when the government is paying interest on bonds or paying interest on bank reserves, uh, they're adding money to the economy. That Those interest payments represent money being added to the economy. But that money is only a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the money that's constantly being created in the economy. Most of the money is being created by the private financial sector. And it's not something you'd see if you're just drawing a line between the public sector and the private sector and watching the flows in between. It's something that's happening within the private sector. Um, and what the government is doing when they're paying interest on bonds, uh, when they're paying interest to the private sector, is they're paying the private sector to create less in money internal to itself. Uh, so the reduction in the amount of money that's being uh, printed or, or, or issued within the private financial sector vastly exceeds the, the interest payments. 
Another way to think about it is that if I'm a financial institution and I want to lend, uh, and the government is offering me, you know, 4%, let's say, on a, a treasury security, I'm going to buy the treasury security rather than lending into the private financial sector. So the government is paying me not to lend to, to the private financial sector, and that reduces the amount of money that uh, is circulating or, or, or flowing uh, from the private financial sector. Um, so you could, you could imagine an extreme case where interest rates are so high that the effect of the interest rate payments um, outstrips the effect of the reduction in the, in the, in the financial sector. Um, but that's really um, uh, an extreme kind of degenerate case. And, and I don't know if we could ever actually reach that point without having other problems first. So it's not a realistic way to describe uh, uh, the effects of uh, interest payments from the government in any, in any realistic way. Is the belief that higher interest rates are inflationary, is this related to why MMT people will talk about uh, how they want interest rates to be zero? Yes. And just summarize for me, like, like, why is that bad? Why should we not want interest rates to be zero in your view? Uh, so, so like I said, when the interest rates are higher, the government is paying the financial sector to lend less. Uh, you're lending to the government instead of lending into the into the private financial sector. When interest rates are lower, that means that the private financial sector is going to want to lend more to make more money internally because they can't make money uh, by lending to the government. Obviously, when MMT people say they want interest rates at zero, they're not saying they want all interest rates at zero. They're saying they want the policy rate to be zero. So that's usually the overnight rate uh, between banks, et cetera. The policy rate, but, right. Right. But the upshot of that is that interest rates are lower than they otherwise would be. And that stimulates the financial sector. The problem with stimulating the financial sector is, well, there's a few problems with it. One of them is that um, now uh, you've, you've got an incentive for people to borrow more and more and you get you get uh, more debt accumulating, uh, perhaps uh, not connected to anything that's going on in the real economy, and you get these credit bubbles and asset bubbles that eventually collapse. This is kind of where uh, the business cycle comes from, where the credit cycle comes from. Um, the you know people borrow money in order to invest in you know other things that people borrow. You know, like there's all this borrowing and investment that kind of builds on itself. Uh, that's not healthy for a, a stable financial sector. So that's part of it. Uh, and then the other part of it is that if you keep interest rates too low, um, now you're skewing the distribution of consumer income such that more people or such that fewer people have more money. This creates an incentive uh, for producers to produce lower quantities at higher prices in the economy because you're, you're going to want to produce goods and services for the people who have, uh, the, actually have the money, and then you're going to you're, you're want to make as much money as possible. Um, that's as opposed to if, if consumer spending was more flatly distributed, you'd produce higher quantities at, at uh, lower prices. So the, the problem is that you're going to have... Um, you're going to have an output gap. The economy, you're going to have prices being kept higher, um, but you're going to have the economy underproducing. It's, it's only producing for the people who have more money. Uh, so, so the economy is not, is not reaching its full potential. So the two problems with low interest rates are that you have the financial instability, which leads to the business cycle, uh, and then the economy is underproducing and there are people who don't have access to goods and services from the economy. And this, I think, leads us to the, the biggest difference, most important difference between MMT and CMT. It's sort of the, what, what is framed as being the overall goal of the economy and then accordingly kind of what, what's the favored policy to change the status quo. So MMT likes to say full employment is the goal. And the problem with the status quo is it's not a, really achieving that as well as it could be. And they propose a federal jobs guarantee to solve that problem. But by contrast, uh, you'll talk about how really the goal ought to be maximum distribution, maximum prosperity uh, for members of the economy. And your preferred method is what you call a calibrated basic income. So let's start with, you know, what is the federal jobs guarantee and what's the problem with that goal? Yeah. So if your goal is to achieve full employment, then a federal jobs guarantee is a great way to do it. Uh, so the MMT people usually define full employment as everyone who wants a job has one. And one way you can accomplish that is just by saying, hey, if you don't have a job and you want one, we'll give you one and we'll find uh, something useful for you to do and pay you uh, a decent wage uh, and then you'll be okay. Um, so that's kind of the, the goal of the federal jobs guarantee is, is, to, is to achieve full employment. And that's 
that's a great way to do that. I just don't think full employment is, is a good goal for the economy. You know, remember that the economy exists for the benefit of the people. So that means the most important role that people play in the economy is the role of consumer. The economy is producing goods and services and the consumers are consuming those goods and services. It's not about um, ensuring that everyone is a producer or a, a worker. It's about ensuring that we can, reap, we can collectively reap the benefits from the economy. Um, so that's kind of like the biggest, um, the biggest difference in terms of like what I want out of the economy compared to, compared to MMT people. Um, and so um, I, I think some like a historical perspective here is useful. I mean, because again, MMT people tend, tend to see, they, they, they believe that the, the whole problem with the economy today is we, we don't have enough employment, right? Where we're they're, they say they're chasing full employment, but they're not really doing it. But I think from your view, it seems like, um, we've we've been aggressively targeting full employment for a very long time at least since the great depression we've been trying to create more jobs as a way of getting wages to people um and there's something fundamentally wrong about this and and mmt actually sort of doubles double da doubles down on this problem yeah i mean i think that's true but i also think they're right that we've been tr trying really hard to achieve full employment and not exactly succeeding uh, and they've got the answer to that which is a uh, a federal jobs guarantee which will actually get us there um the the problem is isn't that we've been failing to achieve full employment though the problem is that that was our goal in the first place so in this way um you know mmt very much agrees with orthodox economics and that you know like uh, labor is the most important resource and the goal should be to achieve full employment and that kind of thing. Um, but it's not, uh, you know, the economy exists uh, for the people. It's not about, it's not about uh, workers. It's about consumers. Mm. Like, so when you're framing the, reframing the emphasis on consumption, what you're sort of doing is saying that, you know, the only purpose of there being a business or a corporation or whatever is that it's, it's making things that, that consumers want, that people want. And then That's according, right. accordingly, it follows that the only the purpose of labor is the same as it's it's valued by producers because the the work they're doing is is necessary to create goods that people want but then the problem would be that technology comes along right and technology means we kind of need less and less human labor over time in order to produce all these things that people want uh, yeah, I think that's true. Um, I would also say that, you know, the labor market has never been the right way to distribute incomes to consumers. Um, you know, the labor market is a market for getting people to do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do. And, and most of the work that we do in our society is stuff that's really valuable and it's not paid, right? It's only when we want people to do something different uh, that uh, the labor market comes into play. Uh, and the extent to which we need that is, you know, it depends on technology. It depends on, you know, all kinds of different things. And there's no reason, uh, there's no reason why we would want to maximize that necessarily or at all. Right. We, you know, like I say, you know, we want the economy to provide goods and services for consumers. We want to maximize the benefit that people receive in terms of material goods, but also in terms of leisure. Like we, we, we want people to have as much freedom as possible to spend their time the way that the way they want to spend it. And, and in order to do that, uh, rather than having a mass government work program push to keep, get everybody employed, you propose a calibrated basic income. And this is something I've only really heard you talk about. What is your basic income proposal? What, what, what makes it uh, calibrated? Yeah, so, the, so I guess the question is, what problem are we trying to solve? And, mm -hmm. and the problem that we're trying to solve is, how do we provide consumers with income so that they can buy things? What's the most efficient way to do that? Uh, so basic income is something that people talk about a lot. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that a lot of the MMT people would define basic income differently than I, than I do. So if you went up to them and asked them what basic income is, they would give you an an, a different answer than, than the answer that I give. So my definition of basic income is a regular income unconditionally paid to every individual person. And then what I advocate is calibrating that basic income to the maximum level that the economy can sustain. Uh, so we don't know what that level is. You know, we gradually increase the amount uh, until we start to reach the productive capacity of the economy. Um, but if you are, if you're trying to force money to people through the financial sector, through the labor market, um, then you run into problems. Uh, you know, you limit people's freedoms or you create financial instability, um, you know, skewed distribution of income, that kind of thing. Uh, in an efficient labor market, 
the only purpose of wages is to provide people an incentive to perform uh, work that we want done because we actually want the output of the labor. Um, and I think, you know, like, I don't want to uh, uh, kind of undercut the MMT people here when they say that there's a lot of really important work that needs doing that the government should be paying for. That is absolutely true. Uh, but rather than guaranteeing the jobs to people, as soon as you're providing a guarantee, to some extent, the job exists for a reason other than wanting the product of the labor. Uh, so instead of guaranteeing the jobs to people, we, we make calculations about what kinds of things do we need done? What kinds of infrastructure do we need built? Do we need a buffer stock of labor? People who are ready to go to a job, um, you know, do we need to keep them active and ready? That kind of thing. Is that good, not for the people, but for the output, for, because we might, might, might want the product of that labor, that kind of thing. Like all of these arguments that you hear for a job guarantee, they could be made for, um, you know, just as an argument for, okay, we need this particular labor, we need this product, right? Um, right, we, we need some new federal jobs. It doesn't mean we need to guarantee a federal job to everyone, and it doesn't mean that that's a reasonable way to solve the problem of poverty. Yes, that's right. Um, you know, and, and, you know, you could imagine an economy in which we don't have the resources to feed everyone, and then poverty is kind of inevitable, that kind of thing. Um, but, if, you know, when we look around, we see that we do have the resources uh, to provide everyone with food, housing, healthcare, you know, like the lot, a lot of stuff that people aren't getting, they could be getting. We have the resources to give them. Uh, and a basic income, if you calibrate it up to the maximum level the economy can sustain, that allows the market to more efficiently allocate these goods and services and resources uh, to people because they're actually able to buy things. There are some resources that are most efficiently allocated by the government. And some of our failings, some of the causes of poverty are things that the government isn't doing that they should be doing. Uh, but some of it is that the market can't do what it's supposed to do because some people don't have money. So it's both. It's really both. Right. The, you generally seem to err on the side of believing that the market works reasonably well for people that have money. If you don't have money, the market doesn't work yes. well for you. And so far, the only our only sanctioned approved mechanism of getting money to people has been wages. And if, right. you, if you believe wages are the only way that you can give people income, then I guess something like a federal jobs guarantee makes sense because you're trying to maximize the amount of income that people get. But wages aren't the only way to give people income. There's also a basic income. We just haven't tried it yet. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I think that's right. Um, we, we tend to think of, of work as being productive because the businesses are hiring these workers, but you know, maybe those businesses wouldn't exist if we didn't have, you know, the financial sector overstimulated or something like that. Um, so we really do. I like to say that the level of employment in the economy is not determined by how much labor we need. It's determined by um, how many jobs we want people to have. Uh, and, and this is actually a point that MMT people make a lot too, which is that you guys don't understand we can just achieve full employment by having the government do it. Uh, and what I'm saying is that, yes, I agree, and that's a bad idea, and it's what we've been trying to do kind of unsuccess, like partly successfully, but, but not fully, uh, forever. Like this is the status quo, and it's broken, and, and it's not about uh, fixing it to get it to work right. It's about maybe abandoning that, that path altogether and understanding that, uh, you know, it's not about, it, not everyone has to be a worker, you know, the labor, not everyone has to work the same amount, the, an efficient labor market. Some people might not be working at all. Some people may be working 80 hours, you know, what matters is that the incentives are such in the economy that the right amount of labor is being performed for the output that we want. Uh, that's, that's all that matters. And then you don't have to have all of these weird economic policies that try to boost people's wages, uh, you know, minimum wage, you know, that kind of stuff. You don't need any of that stuff. There's, there are a lot of, I, I think, you know, it can be hard to say exactly how much of the, of the policy we have is a result of lack of an effective mechanism to get spending money into the hands of consumers. But a lot of it is, right? Like food is something that you would think could be allocated by the market, right? You know, if, if you have money, you're going to buy food for yourself. That's pretty universal. Uh, yet we have people who are hungry, Right. And we have programs in place like food stamps, you know, and soup kitchens and all of these things to try to to address this problem of hunger uh, when it's really uh, the fact that we haven't given the market the we haven't given the consumers in the market the means of consumption, the means of, of, of buying that food. 
Right. If you don't have money, you can't buy food. And yes. if you're going to have some other means of distributing food, you know, if the government's going to do that, well, typically the way they're going to do that is by paying people with money to create these programs and find people that need the food and hand it out. Um, so it's, it's sort of an extra unnecessary step. We should at least try giving the money out first and seeing uh, for how many people that solves the problem for. Yeah. And I think, you know, intuitively, a lot of the MMT people think that the job guarantee wage is somehow going to be higher than the amount of basic income we can afford to pay out. Uh, and I think that's actually the opposite of, of what's true because the basic income allows the labor market to be more efficient. And if, you give it, if you're giving money to rich people, that doesn't really change the amount of money you can afford to give to poor people anyway, because we know that, the, we know that Bill Gates wasn't going to buy the same stuff that you know, the poor person would have bought. So he's not using up capacity that, that the poor person would have bought. Um, okay, so... Um... Uh, let's see. So there's a couple other uh, ancillary MMT points that you wrote here that I was interested in. You, you, okay, you, could I just comment on that uh, a little yeah, bit more? Yeah, please, please. Uh, so, so for calibrating the basic income, I wouldn't go until we start to hit inflation and then pull back. You know, there's, there's uh, macroeconomic indicators we can look at to tell mm -hmm. if we're getting, getting close. So usually when I talk about this, I don't say that it's, it's based on inflation. It's based on the productive capacity of the economy. And you want to stop before you've fully maxed out that capacity. And then you've got some room for, you know, monetary policy to adjust to fluctuations in people's uh, psychology and spending patterns and, and, and stuff like that. Um, something that uh, worries me about the kind of full MMT version of a jobs guarantee is that since they're keeping interest rates at zero, uh, the financial sector is already overstimulated, already kind of, uh, uh, putting inflationary pressure, and there's, there's nothing to counteract the additional spending uh, that you're adding to the economy through the jobs guarantee. Uh, so with the basic income, as you increase the basic income, you would expect the Fed to tighten and rein in the private financial sector. And you'd expect that to balance out, it would flatten out the demand curve, it would help close uh, the output gap in the economy. Mm. If you have a federal jobs guarantee, you could do something similar, but it would still require you know, the Fed tightening, the Fed raising interest rates. And, and for some reason, well, I, I don't need to get, MMT people generally want to keep uh, interest rates at zero. And that kind of, uh, I think, prevents you from, mm -hmm. from really doing a jobs guarantee the way they describe that they would want to do it. You think those two things are actually working against each other? Yes, very much so. Um, I mean, another key difference here is that when, when they talk about federal jobs guarantee, they're usually using the language of a counter-cyclical policy and or maybe an ideal one but you talk about basic income in a in a different way about actually ending or or moving towards ending the business cycle altogether and that's a very different yeah. way of phrasing it why do you put it that way uh, so it's useful to think about why we have the business cycle in the first place um, and I would say that this is a side effect of the fact that we're using the financial sector as a way of propping up consumer spending so we overstimulate the financial sector to boost consumer spending, prevent deflation, uh, and, uh, and as a side effect, you get these asset bubbles that you know, grow and eventually collapse and then businesses fail, people lose their jobs, and you get a recession. When you think about what a recession is, it's actually uh, lowered economic output. So the, the, the level of production in the economy goes down. Uh, and it typically goes down because uh, people don't have as much money to spend, so they can't buy as much stuff. If instead of propping up consumer spending uh, using the financial market in this really unstable way, you directly fund consumer spending using a basic income, then whatever happens in the financial market, if it collapses or whatever, consumers still have their money to spend, right? Uh, and, and the financial sector is not going to collapse as much in the first place because you've reined it into a more stable, sustainable level. Uh, so in this way, basic income really, uh, especially if you calibrate it up to the capacity the economy can sustain, it really ends the business cycle. There's no, there's no more recessions due to problems in financial markets. You'd have to have an actual hit to the economy's productive capacity, that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, it's, it seems like you're yeah. focused on recessions as as lowered output. You're focused on output and distribution of output, which is a lot. Whereas a lot of people, when they talk about the economy doing well or doing poorly, they're sort of ignoring those huge fluctuations and they're thinking about, well, how many jobs are available? What does this affect on labor? So they'll actually talk right. about. You see this in news all the time. They talk about recessions 
defined as, oh, the, you know, people are losing jobs. But in your view, if it's like if we have the output and we distribute that output, then we, we don't need as many jobs. Yeah. Uh, And, you know, like in the 1930s during the Great Depression, we had more productive capacity than we had had in the 1920s, yet we were producing less because people didn't have the money. So Keynes Keynes came along and he was like, well, it's because people don't have jobs. We need to get people jobs so they can have money to spend so they can buy stuff. Well, sort of. We just need people to have money to spend so they can buy stuff. You can skip the jobs part. The jobs, you know, like and then the job, maybe some jobs will come along as, you know, the, the, the demand, the consumer demand com- creates demand for goods and services, which creates demand for labor. Maybe some jobs will happen that way. But the goal should not be jobs. Right. Right. As long yeah. as you make the goal full employment. You, well, that's that's right there in the mandate of the Federal Reserve. That's what we've been doing. It's what politicians constantly promise people more jobs. Uh, I mean, I, I yeah. put it to someone a, a little while ago that it's almost like, well, what we really need often is more money, but we're kind of ashamed to ask for that. So we'll ask for more jobs because we want to show that we're willing to work, even if the technological economy just doesn't need our labor as much as it used to. Yeah, we have, we're in the habit of pretending that we're contributing and, and kind of earning, earning our money, that kind of thing. And we're in the habit of, of using our economic policy to make it feel like, make people feel like they're earning their money. Uh, and it's really, really inefficient. Um, just to kind of get back to the point about, uh, the federal jobs guarantee being kind of this counter cyclical automatic stabilizer. The idea is that when the economy is doing well, people have their private sector jobs. And then when the economy is doing poorly, um, they can get the, the job guarantee jobs. Uh, And that can prevent uh, their incomes from dropping to zero and, and, and push back against, uh, against the business cycle, against, uh, against the recession. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, it would, it would kind of have that effect. Um, but you know, you don't need basic income, a calibrated basic income ends the business cycle. So, so you don't need these kinds of, uh, jobs based counter cyclical, uh, fiscal policies. Yeah. You don't need a counter cyclical policy if there's no cycle Cycle. anymore. That's right. Um, okay. Um, this is, we're sort of wrapping up here, but um, there's a couple other notes you wrote of things that MMT people talk about you wanted to mention. So there's this yeah. idea of um, uh, the conflict theory of inflation. What did you mean by that? Um, how, uh, how, is, how, how is class conflict related to the setting of prices in the MMT view? Uh, yeah. So, so the idea is that there's a negotiation between, you know, workers and employers and, uh, you know, capital owners and that kind of thing. It, they kind of like pull in some, some, some Marxian stuff. Um, this is in the, in the textbook, the uh, Bill Mitchell, Randall Ray, uh, I forget who the third guy is, uh, textbook. They talk about the conflict theory of inflation. Uh, and, you know, like, I think there are a lot of factors that go into why people spend more money, why, why prices go up, why production changes, that kind of thing. But when it comes down to it, inflation, again, is about the, flow of, of consumer spending and then the flow of production coming back in the other direction and whether those two things are, are matched up with each other. Um, so, you know, you can, you can tweak that uh, by giving people money or, or, or by changing, you know, the incentive to use resources in production, you know, that kind of thing. You know, there are lots of ways to, to, um, to modulate uh, consumer spending, to modulate production in the economy um, that don't necessarily have to relate to all the different things that might, uh, you know, cause inflation, including, uh, you know, class conflict or something like that. Uh, and, and I don't think, you know, having class conflict as the basis uh, for your theory of inflation really makes sense, even though some of that might affect prices in some ways, that kind of thing. Gotcha. Um, okay. Um, and, and let me just uh, to, yeah. to talk about in inflation a little bit more. Um, I think MMT people often imagine that uh, the purchasing power of currency is anchored to wages and that something like a job guarantee can yeah. ensure that uh, the currency's purchasing power is, is, is stable uh, because we're giving people stable wages, that kind of thing. Uh, and they make these arguments about how that's going to keep, keep the currency stable, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I'm going to say uh, that, 
doesn't really that doesn't really make sense in in terms of a market economy what you need in a currency is that you need it to be stable with respect to consumer goods and we use monetary policy to do that we you know like we 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 modulate the flow of spending in order to in order to accomplish that we we influence supply and demand you know that kind of stuff it's not about um it's not about labor. Labor is very, very integrated into the uh, MMT view of how the economy mm. works. Like even right. before when we were talking about um, taxes driving the currency, you know, what MMT imagines is that the government imposes a tax liability, which, uh, which in turn, um, you know, provisions labor for the government because now people have to work in order to earn their mo- earn their money back so they can pay the taxes and then not only is money tax based but it's labor based like it's it's anchored to labor and 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 taxes are are all about labor and you know it's a very labor oriented way of of thinking about it and and I think when you have that perspective it can be hard to look at something like a basic income and say well wait a minute that doesn't doesn't make any sense it's not activating any labor how can how can you add money to the economy without activating labor that kind of thing yeah it's it sidesteps the whole labor question uh because it's emphasizing goods distribution of goods and money and um uh yeah so it doesn't it doesn't uh it doesn't fall into that view um okay right. so so um i think the other big there's a category that, and we touched on this already, but just to sum up, I mean, because there's a, a big difference between your view, CMT and MMT, is the emphasis on the state. And they like to really emphasize, you know, money as, as a creature of the state. They emphasize um, the state's role in in setting prices, we just talked about, through through wages. And, um, you know, do you, do you take the opposite view? Do you think that money is a creature of the market? Or is it is this something in between? Is this a hybrid view? I mean, I would say that it's both, uh, but I would say that money is ultimately a creature of the market. So you can't have a market without a stable unit of value. Um, and as as markets emerged and as as markets evolved, currency emerged along with them in order to facilitate those markets and, and make them work. Uh, and then gov- governments also emerged, right? And and the the institutions that manage economic policy emerged as well. And by having you know a central bank, by having monetary policy, um, you're able to provide a more stable standard unit of value for your markets. So the institutions are really, really, really important. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if the institutions fail, then the market is going to find something else to use as its currency. So, so the, the state isn't the end of the story. The state has to do the right things in order to manage its currency, in order to maintain uh, kind of monetary sovereignty. Like monetary sovereignty isn't like once you get it, you have it. And it's not, it doesn't depend on, you know, having a military or, or being able to use force, you know, your government powers, that kinds, kinds of things. Like those things can help for sure, but it really depends on your ability to ensure that your market has this stable standard currency. Right. It, you, you And this makes sense in that you emphasize the role of the central bank a lot more <clears throat> than they do. The way I hear a lot of MMT people talk, it's kind of like they even want, they want monetary policy and fiscal policy to sort of be the same thing. It's almost like they view what the central bank is doing as kind of getting in the way of the state just taking over control of the money and just do managing labor the way it's supposed to be managed. But you're much more, um, well, I guess you're, you're much more optimistic about the role of the central bank. You don't like their mandate of full employment, but you think it's really important how they're using monetary policy to manage prices, right? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, but I also do agree with the MMT people that the fiscal authorities aren't doing enough. Hmm. Um, you know, the, the, I would say that the fiscal authorities uh, should be spending more money. They should be providing a calibrated basic income that allows the fed to tighten. And in my mind, you know, the higher interest rates are the fed getting out of the way are the fed saying, okay, the, 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 government is doing what it needs to do to, to support its economy. And we're picking up the slack, you know, compensating for any volatility that's left over that kind of thing. The MMT people would imagine that zero interest rates are the Fed getting out of the way. Um, so, so that's, that's an area where we differ. Uh, I think, you know, the central bank is always going to be important. Um, but I do think that they've been tasked unfairly with uh, doing some of the things that are really the responsibility of the government and the fiscal authority. Mm. Mm. And that is su- supporting comp- consumer spending in kind of the primary way. Mm. Yeah. Uh, 
Very cool. This is great. Um, I'm, I, you know, I've spent some time with MMT people. I took a, a 10 hour cl- course in the city in MMT and I went to a conference that was at Stony Brook uh, where Stephanie Kelton was. There's clearly a lot of smart people there working on, on interesting material. I'd really like to hear them engage more with this view of yours uh, as a basic income advocate. This has just struck me as being kind of that um, it, it's, taking the key insights from MMT, but it's showing what it's really explaining in further detail why a basic income is so important, why it's such an overlooked um, feature of markets that we need to be paying more attention for. So I, I really hope that uh, some MMT people see this and reach out to you for more discussion or debate on this. Hey, that'd be great. Nice. Yeah.